Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. So for the next couple of minutes, I will be sharing with you my journey as a volunteer uh, in uh, patient care centre, communicable disease centre. So, um, back in 2001, I happened to hear of the volunteer training program offered by patient care centre. Uh, so I signed up for the training program and then after a few Saturdays of training, we became certified. Uh, we, as in uh, the other new volunteers, myself, we became certified as volunteers. So that allows us to start visiting the wards. Um, unfortunately, uh, for the first couple of weeks, probably about two months, I was very unhappy because um, I'm an introvert. I don't talk very much. And I couldn't chat up the patient, so I felt very useless, very redundant compared to the other volunteers who were very chatty, uh, they could make the patients laugh, they could entertain the patients. So at, at that time, I was feeling very discouraged, maybe this is just not for me. Then um, I think maybe one night I started thinking, oh, but if I cannot use my mouth, maybe I can use my hands. Because back when I was doing my PhD in the San Francisco Bay Area, I did go for Swedish massage training classes on the side. So uh, that Saturday, I was very excited. I asked the administrator at Patient Care Centre at that time, uh, Sister Mary Stevens. I asked, so Sister Mary, do you think I can do uh, massage for the patients. Then she was very excited. She said, yes, uh, this is a form of touch therapy. So uh, she encouraged me and that's how I got started. So soon, other uh, volunteers also got into the act of doing massaging. <laughs> so I found my niche. <laughs> so uh, eventually, and I have been with the uh, patient care center since then uh, to today. Mm. So uh, every week, I will go down on Saturday afternoons unless um, maybe I'm traveling or maybe I'm ill <laughs> or maybe there's some event in NUS which I cannot miss. So I make it a point to always be there on Saturday afternoons. Okay. So um, maybe a little bit about touch therapy. Um, for my fellow volunteers and myself, um, many of them actually they are not trained in doing massage but I keep telling them it's okay because it's really ultimately the touch that makes a difference um, I think um, where we can make an impact on patients living with HIV AIDS is they are very stigmatized so a number of them have been estranged from families some of them abandoned by friends and the fact that a stranger, a volunteer, comes forward and touches him or her, it sends a very strong signal of acceptance, of love. So that touch itself is very healing, it's very therapeutic. So um, you, you really feel fulfilled and at joy when you see some of your patients falling asleep when you start massaging them. Yes. So, to, uh, to us, that is the greatest signal of validation. <laughs> yes. Okay, then, um, yes, as I shared, I think, in the vid video earlier on this morning, uh, to me, a lot of people argue that volunteering is giving, <laughs> but I beg to differ because, um, to me, the takeaways from volunteering far exceed the time and the effort that you give. So um, over the years, for me, I have learned to be less judgmental. Uh, in fact, this was reinforced in all our new volunteers from the time we entered the training program. We cannot judge the patients. So uh, most of the time, we actually all the time, we don't ask the patients, how did you contract HIV? Uh, rather, 
if they choose to share their story, then we will listen. So uh, we are all trained not to be judgmental. <laughs> so that's one takeaway for me. Second, over the years, I've become more patient <laughs> because many of the patients in the wards, I mean, they have a lot of pain, discomfort, so they are not the nicest person sometimes. They have moods and some of them are depressed, so they could shoo you away and then you try to engage in small talk, they'll brush you off or even after you massage them, they'll complain that, oh, uh, your technique is no good. <laughs> so uh, then you, you, learn, you learn to be more patient, yes, because you learn empathy, you put yourself in the shoes of the patient and no, the pain, the suffering, the discomfort they are going through. So uh, I learned to become more patient and empathetic. Mm. Then um, also to me, um, another thing that bows me away is really to be able to see for myself uh, some of the patients, they are in very, very bad state and yet, they are very cheerful, they are very stoic, very determined, very optimistic. And then you wonder why. So sometimes they are the ones who are comforting you. Never mind. <laughs> um, you know, you don't have to be sad for me. I know my time is running out. You know, but at least uh, we spend time together week after week. So sometimes you, you just cannot understand the sort of optimism that some of the patients bring along. <laughs> Then another thing that really has touched me is occasionally you will come across uh, family members and these family members really love their loved one unconditionally. So over the years, I have seen like mothers frail, really not in the best of health, and then they will limp along bringing like home-cooked food for maybe the son who could be dying. And, and acts like that really blow you away. Uh, uh, and also, I always cannot forget a case of a male patient. He was uh, at the end stage, so he was dying. But he was a very difficult person, <laughs> uh, very crabby, very verbally abusive. And most of the time when we went to the ward, we would see him verbally abusing the wife. And for the wife, you know, uh, we soon found out actually she is also HIV positive. She was infected by the husband. And yet, you see this woman, uh, she is tending to his every need, probably 24-7. And then she never gets impatient uh, and she just lovingly tends to him until the very end. So, you ask yourself, how come you encounter such people yeah, who can love so unconditionally when you would expect a woman like her to be bitter, resentful and hateful, but you don't? So it's acts like that that really touch you in a very personal way. Mm. And then uh, when you see your favourite patients passing on, then it also hits on you that, oh, uh, life is very... Uh, fragile, the uh, frailty of life, uh, human mortality. So you become more sensitized also. And that also means you cherish every day that you have. So to me, that is another takeaway. Mm. Okay, then about commitment. So uh, why am I still volunteering in uh, the wards? Uh, to me, right, I think firstly is to recognize the takeaways far outweigh and exceed the time and effort that you give towards volunteering. So for me, that's what brings me back to the wards every week. Mm -hmm. And also, um, you know, right now in NUS, I have got three jobs to handle. So. I'm always very tired. Sometimes in the taxi, I'll fall asleep. But I push myself every Saturday. I really block out that afternoon. I must go down to the wards. So it's a matter of discipline. It's a matter of prioritization. Uh, because it's so easy for, for you to 
uh, to rationalize. I'm very tired, I need a break, <laughs> and I have still a lot of assignments or tasks that are outstanding. I could use that Saturday afternoon to catch up on my work. Or uh, maybe some of our younger volunteers know <laughs> we need to go dating or I haven't seen my uh, friends for the longest time. So if you start rationalizing, very soon you will drop out, which is the case because the reality is in the volunteer sector, uh, the attrition is very high. The attrition rate is high. That's the reality. Uh, but so I encourage the newer volunteers um, you must set aside that time, uh, guard it very selfishly and commit to like, always coming back each week no matter how tired or busy you are. So uh, to me, it requires a lot of discipline. And then um, uh, maybe also I would like to share a personal story. So I started in 2001. So things were very uneventful for the next couple of years. But in 2007, I still remember it was just before Chinese New Year. One Saturday, I got a shock because in the ward, I saw my loved one, uh, a family member. Uh, actually, before that, I had sort of suspected and I had asked him, oh, do you have HIV? Then he denied. Then because of that, I was allowed into a sort of complacency. But that Saturday when I saw him, I, I just didn't know what to do. And then he was also very uncomfortable. So he pulled me aside and he told me, please, please, I beg of you, don't tell any other family member. Don't tell any of our relatives. So I was at one time shocked at another time also angry with him. Why do you burden me with this sort of uh, promise which I probably may not be able to keep because I would end up lying to people because people would start to ask me, oh, what is the condition of that loved one? So I was very angry, I was confused. But, you know, for the next couple of months, I had a lot of support, very strong support from the other volunteers and then from the healthcare workers like Prof Lee, Li Cheng Chuan, <laughs> and then um, the medical social worker, Ms. Ho Lai Ping, and then like the nurses like Sister Nisha, she's still in the ward. <laughs> so these people really gave me a lot of support emotionally. And really, um, it also dawned on me, I think God brought me to uh, the wards in 2001, he was preparing me to journey with my own loved one like uh, six years later. So he was preparing for, for this journey for me. So then that's when I bucked up and I, and I told myself, yes, now it's very clear uh, for the next couple of months because my loved one uh, is already towards the end stage, so I must journey with him. So he eventually passed on in like around August. Um, but during that period of time, the, uh, the friends, the relatives, the family members who came to visit him, they asked me a lot of questions because they know that I'm a volunteer. So they asked me what's wrong with him and I had to lie. And that was a very terrible feeling that I experienced each time. And it really struck me the sort of stigma that we still attach to HIV. So I really experienced that in a very personal way. So after he has passed on, uh, that's when I made a commitment to God. Like so long as I'm able-bodied, I will still continue to volunteer in the ward um, so that I can continue to journey with other patients who have HIV. So uh, to me, that personal loss is also an opportunity for me to renew that commitment uh, as a volunteer in the ward. Um, uh, actually, I'm also quite excited that um, within the past year, we have not only the, the volunteers who are with me, we have not only been working with 
uh, patients with HIV. We have also expanded our services, volunteer services, to patients in other wards in communicable disease centre. So those are the step-down care wards where you will meet every week. A lot of very cute grandpas, grandmas, a lot of them uh, with dementia, but they are very, very lovable. So we also like reach out to them and they love our massages. <laughs> yes, yes. Then, oh, another thing is uh, what keeps me going is also, I think I constantly remind myself I need to protect myself. Uh, um, so sometimes when you're very passionate about volunteering, you can develop like a sort of co-dependency relationship with your favorite patients. And to me, that is not healthy. So as much as we love them, we also should at least be quite clear, uh, we should be very professional. Uh, we don't uh, have a codependent relationship where every day we wait for the patient to call us or, or to message us, and then whenever they have a request, we quickly go down to buy whatever they want. To me, that's not healthy because eventually you'll burn out. Mm. So I always share with the newer volunteers, yes, uh, let's be professional. Uh, so while we are there in the ward, we do our best. But after that, we also need a bit of our own space uh, to do other things. And also when you have patients who pass on your favorite patients, it's okay to grieve. But again, we need to be able to let go of that grief eventually and move on because there will be other patients who need us to journey with them. Uh, so that's how I protect myself. Okay, then to me, right, it's also a blessing that I'm in an educational institution. So I reach out to a lot of students. I share with them uh, the work that we do in the wards. And so over the years, uh, I've been blessed because many of my students and ex-students have come on board to volunteer alongside me. Of course, some of them moved on, they have other priorities, but I like to think that during that period when they were volunteering, um, that experience must have touched them in a certain way. Yeah. So advocacy, to me, I think all of us can do our part. Mm -hmm. And also opportunities to share with colleagues, with friends, and even members of the public, so like the taxi drivers. So, um, very frequently, the taxi drivers will ask you, what's your agenda? Why are you going to a uh, communicable disease centre on a Saturday? And then these are golden opportunities for you to share with them what uh, HIV is, what it is not, and to destigmatize the, the uh, disease. So to me, uh, this is also another form of advocacy that we can advance in our own personal way. Mm. So, uh, I think that's all <laughs> I have to share. So, thank you. <laughs>